Good afternoon, and thank you. Last year, I shared a story with you that I think bears repeating. Captain Charles Plum was a naval aviator and flew an F-4 Phantom off the Kitty Hawk over Vietnam. He got shot down and spent six years as a prisoner of war. When he got out, he went on the speaking circuit and told his story. He told how he had been tortured, beaten, starved, how he had survived six years, most of which was in an eight by eight cell. It's a very impressive talk. One evening, he was in a restaurant, and a patron came up to him, and he kept on staring at him, and he said, aren't you Captain Charles Plum? And he said, yes, I am. And he said, you flew an F-4 Phantom off the Kitty Hawk, got shot down, spent six years as a POW. He said, yeah, that's true. How did you happen to know that? And he said, because I'm the guy who packed your parachute. He was awestruck. And as he thought about that, after their brief conversation, he said he couldn't even sleep that night. He said, did I ever even recognize this sailor? See, I'm a jet jockey, I'm on the flight deck, he's down below folding panels, and I might not even have said hello to him if I passed him in the hall. But yet, if he hadn't been doing his job, I wouldn't be here. At Evans Financial Group, many of you know that we do monthly workshops on retirement planning. I've told the Charles Plum story many, many times. At the end of that story, I finish with, ladies and gentlemen, at Evans Financial Group, we pack financial parachutes. Some of you have had an opportunity to see Charles Plum because this is our third event in a row where we recognize veterans, and Charles Plum was our guest speaker at the first event. We videotaped it, and if you would like a copy of that, come by our office and we'll give you a DVD. Last year, many of you in the audience got to see Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, and in your red bag, there's a DVD of that presentation, along with Rodney Demery, who's a, um, the detective that has the show, Murder Chose Me. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here to pay honor and, and, and just respect and thanks to the people that have served in the military. Would you do me this favor? If you have served in the military, if you are physically able, would you please stand that we might recognize you and say thank you? Thank you. You know, when you're in the military, you have what's called an MOS, which is your military occupational specialty. And really, it doesn't matter what your MOS or your specialty was. The people that you just saw stand up, they're parachute packers. See, when Charles Plum would finish his talk, he'd say, who packed your parachute? Or whose parachute are you packing? And you all, have been parachute packers. You packed parachutes for the United States. You packed honor, dedication, and service to a great and grateful nation, and we thank you for that. <clears throat> it's my honor and privilege to now introduce the founding pastor of the church at Red River to give our invocation. Pastor Troy Parker. Amen. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we've gathered this afternoon to celebrate heroes. And we know that celebrating heroes is something that's not foreign to you because in your word, you name and celebrate men and women who led, who served, who sacrificed for the benefit of others. 
And so, Lord, that's what we do today. We, we've come together to celebrate the men and women who are our veterans, who have served, who have sacrificed, who have given themselves to protect us and to defend the principles which we believe that you have given every human being. And so we welcome you. We welcome your presence here this afternoon. And Lord, we ask that you would place your hand upon the speakers as they share their life stories, and that you would open our hearts to respond to the challenges that they lay before us. And so, God, we pray uh, for your blessing upon uh, the Evans family, Lord, upon the, the, pe the great people of Evans Financial who have worked so hard to organize this event to celebrate and to honor the men and women who are our veterans. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the United States Marine Corps Color Guard, provided by Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 23rd Marines. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Jessica Janae Brock to sing our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proud At the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner the land of the free and Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage your event host and organizer, managing partner of Evans Financial Group, Colin Evans. Welcome, heroes. This is our third year. I get so fired up, and I, I mean, my anxiety level at lunchtime, I had to go home and take another blood pressure pill. I was, it was way up there, but everything, everything has fallen. Last year at this event, we gave away an AR-15. So I decided I'm going to give another one away, because I like AR-15s, and I think most of you guys do too. To get registered for this, you'll need your smartphone. They're going to put a, uh, a photo and a phone number up. You have to dial the area, dial 318-461-4003, and text the words winner. It's going to ask you your name, and then it's going to ask you for your email address, and then we'll get you registered. You might to our Facebook page because I'm going to give it away live on Facebook next Friday. So pay attention to that. That's just something we get to do. Our good friends over at Mission First were actually joining in and they donated some of, the, some of the cool hardware and the parts on that. You know, we get to be back here at the Municipal Auditorium at the Louisiana Hayward. You know, hosted such acts. Johnny Cash. B.B. King, Elvis, Aretha Franklin. To share the same stage is, is just an honor. But it was also an honor because of the history of this was named originally on Armistice Day at the time, which is now known as Veterans Day. We host this event as close as we can on, you know, to Veterans Day so we can honor you guys. You know, our mission statement uh, for our company was to make positive, life-changing, lasting differences in the communities that we serve. And when we wrote, you know, we decided what better way to serve our community than to serve those that have served our country. I think there's no greater honor to serve those that have served our country. It's, that's just something I absolutely, absolutely love. I need you guys to really, really do me a favor. And I want you to look around. You notice the banners that are And in the back of your program, you're going to see a lot of the companies that help sponsor this. They dedicated time. They dedicated money. They dedicated their support to help us put this on. You know, and really when the timing is right the next time it's time for you guys to buy a new vehicle do me a favor go check out my friends at Yoakum or go check out Holmes Honda I'm sure they would appreciate it because they appreciate you guys next time, I think my mic's cutting out a little bit the next time you go out to dinner look at Silver Star check out the go with this one They're great places to eat, and they would appreciate your business. If you like AR-15s like I do, and you decide you want to get one built, check out our friends at 556 Tactical. I was the founder of that company. Our other owners are down here. And while you're at it, our friends over at Vortex and Mission First, they were sponsors in this as well. Add that stuff into your rifle. If it's banking time and it's like, I'm fed up with my bank, I want you to check out Barksdale Federal Credit Union and get it, or go see our friends over at Progressive because they sponsored this event. As we age, uh, I've noticed this thing, I think everything starts to break after 40. I have found that out. I'm now 42. And it's time for readers or, you know, the eyesight starts to go. <laughs> Go see our friends at Lusk Eye Specialist or Willis Night Eye Institute because they help put this on. 
Tax time. Oh, tax time. Don't get me started. But we got our friends over at RBM and White Lawn Rice and Green. I could continue and go on and on. We've got a ton of people that sponsored this event that want to be a part of this. And I want to make sure, too, that if you haven't checked out yet, just off of Line Avenue, right north of um, Twisted Root, is a state of the art gun range. I mean, this thing is bad to the bone. It's, you, can, you can shoot 100 yards inside, and you don't have to zip your target back and forth. You just look at it 100 yards, and you look at the computer screen that's right next to you, and you can, as they've got cameras that are on your target. That's pretty awesome. I'm encouraging you to check these folks out because they deserve, and if you don't mind, give these companies a round of applause for being a part of this. How many, show of hands, how many were here last year? Yeah, I like that, over half of you guys. It means we got some new faces here. You got to see Oliver North and my good buddy Rodney Demery. I just found out a uh, day before yesterday, um, the no, they're not doing the Murder Chose Me show anymore. And it was actually um, because the stories were either too grotesque to show on TV or really boring. So. Unfortunately, we're not going to see him on television. Well, Rodney introduced me to Carl Marino, who is our next speaker. Carl grew up in Hornell, New York. He attended the U.S. Military Academy at West Point for two years. He became a deputy sheriff in Monroe County and served 17 years on the force. He started acting about 10 years ago. He was doing numerous films, TV shows, commercials, in 2010, he was cast as the lead role in the show Homicide Hunter on Investigative Discovery, and he plays the part of Lieutenant Joe Kenda. It's now in its ninth and its final season. In his spare time, Carl and his wife Ilona, they run marathons, and they run marathons to raise money. They've given over $200,000 to wounded warriors, to chari uh, uh, cancer charities, as well as first responders. They just moved, or are racking up next week, moving from the state of uh, California, I mean California, um, to the great state of Tennessee. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and a privilege. I got to enjoy dinner with this uh, couple last night. Let me introduce a friend of mine, Mr. Carl Marino. Well, first off, I want to thank uh, Evans Financial Group for uh, hosting this fantastic, important event and uh, inviting me to speak. You know, I won't take up too much of your time, as I know I'm not the one you came to hear. Uh, I can't wait to hear Chris Brown speak as well. I want to acknowledge and thank all the heroes in attendance tonight, from the veterans to the first responders to the active duty members and, of course, all their families. Uh, thank you for all the sacrifices you've all made to keep our society safe and free. Uh, you can never get enough appreciation. My wife and I had had a pretty impressive few weeks meeting some of this country's heroes. We had our fifth fan cruise for the show two weeks ago, and on it was the Delta Force commander who located and took Saddam Hussein into custody. Uh, he took the time to sit down and walk me through uh, all the details of that amazing operation. When we got back to port in New York City, we were invited to watch a live taping of the Greg Gutfield show uh, at the Fox News building. On Greg's panel was none other than Robert O'Neill, the Navy SEAL who shot and killed Osama bin Laden. And now I get to meet and hear Chris Tonto Peranto speak. I mean, that's a few good weeks and a lot of dead terrorists. <laughs> in 1989, during my sophomore year at West Point, uh, we had the honor of having former President Ronald Reagan speak to us in the mess hall during lunch. Uh, he was there to re receive the Thayer Award, which is given every year to a, quote, outstanding citizen whose service and accomplishments in the national interest exemplify the Military Academy motto, duty, honor, country. I dare say there was no more of a deserving person than President Reagan. When he entered the mess hall, we were ecstatic. 
Uh, at West Point, all 4,000 cadets eat in the same room in the same building in Washington Hall. You know, all 4,000 of us were standing on our chairs, screaming our heads off, waving our napkins over our heads, as cadets tend to do. You know, this was our hero, and it was quite a scene. After the standing ovation finally subsided, which was several minutes later, and he spoke, all he did his entire speech was to praise us and to compliment us on our service and accomplishments. I remember being amazed hearing our hero telling us how much he thought of us as heroes. Me thinking, here we are, just a bunch of kids in our late teens, early 20s, just trying to survive the everyday rigors of academy life. But every person that took that first step, well, looking back on it, he was right. Every person that took that first step in the grueling competitive application appointment process and uh, seen it through to step into the long gray line did it with a desire to serve and with the knowledge that they may have to lead men and women into battle, all of which, including themselves, may have to pay the ultimate sacrifice to the country. Unfortunately for me, my desire to serve in my extreme patriotism was much, much stronger than my grasp of physics and differential equations. Or as I like to say, my scholarship ran out after two years. However, with the advent of social media over the years, uh, I've been able to reconnect and follow the careers of my friends and classmates, and, and, and I've watched them become the heroes that Ronald Reagan told us where we were that day in 1989. Several of those friends and former classmates are generals and full bird colonels now. Uh, one of my classmates was just promoted to Brigadier General and recently became the 78th Commandant of Cadets at West Point. I've been very proud watching many of my former classmates continue serving our country almost 30 years later, when they easily could have cashed out and taken lucrative jobs in the private sector. Unfortunately, I have also had to mourn a few of them as well that perished heroically on the battlefield overseas. I then chose another route to serve my country, and I became a deputy sheriff in Monroe County, New York, which is basically Rochester. Now, I worked primarily in our maximum security jails, and unfortunately, uh, business in Rochester was very good. I did that for 17 years until the job got to be just too much. You know, the stress and PTSD were at a level where a change was needed. So I did what all former police officers do. I moved to California and became an actor. And I like to tell people I became an actor the traditional way. I answered an ad on Craigslist. And that's actually a true story. I was very fortunate and very lucky and found I had a knack for acting. Uh, one thing led to another. I worked hard at it. And I ended up with lead role in my own TV show, which just finished its ninth season, as Colin was saying on the ID network. It's, uh, it's Homicide Hunter, Lieutenant Joe Kenda, and it's on Wednesdays at 9 p.m., shameless plug. One thing I'm most proud of is that my show promotes and honors law enforcement. So many of the true crime shows glorify the bad guys and their crimes. Homicide Hunter shows the side of policing that the public doesn't often see. The good deeds and the sacrifices these men and women make to keep society safe and to get the dangerous elements off the streets. Every officer on the show is an actual Knoxville, Tennessee police officer. Well, every one of them except for my wife. Uh, there's a little nepotism involved there, just like in actual police departments. <laughs> Working with these heroes for the past nine years has kept me updated on what's involved in policing today. It's an entirely different job than when I was an officer even just 11 years ago. I wouldn't want to do their job today. I'm asked often by young men and women for advice about possibly becoming police officers. But my advice is always the same. Don't do it. Go to college, get a job, learn a trade that makes you happy and you can make some money. I'm kind of only kidding. I, mean, I always tell them that only do it if it's your true calling and you want to help people. Because it'll change you as a person. Only do it if you can take the constant abuse and disrespect from today's society. When you're just trying to do your job, to do it to the best of your ability and just to get home to your family. I'm not sure I could do the job in today's society, but I commend all of you heroes that still do. 
I was just in New York City where, and as you've all seen down the news, uh, the officers are having water and other things thrown at them, unable to do their jobs, and some even being executed in their cruisers. The war on police needs to end now, and they need to be treated like the heroes that they are. Well, I found another way to serve, and it's, it's one I'm most proud of. When I met my now wife and started dating her 10 years ago, she was training for a half marathon. Uh, like a good boyfriend, uh, trying to impress his new girlfriend, I started training with her. I mean, how difficult could a half marathon be? I used to run cross country in high school. It's extremely difficult. <laughs> but I did it, finished well, and started uh, becoming a little addicted to crossing those finish lines. When I decided to run my first full marathon a year later, which I found was 100 times more difficult than a half marathon, uh, my wife was trying to qualify for the Boston Marathon. Uh, on race day, I, I kept up with her pace through the first half of the race, but I was struggling. Then I lied to her. I knew that if I kept running with her, I would start failing, and being the sweetheart she is, she would stay with me and she'd never qualify for the Boston Marathon. So I told her I had to use the bathroom for her to go on. And I'd meet her at the finish line. And reluctantly, she drove on. I went and hung out in the porta potty for about 10 minutes, and then resumed running the course at a very slower pace. Well, I can't remember if it was mile 17 or mile 20. I mean, they all start getting a little foggy for me around that time. I was feeling very sorry for myself. Everything hurt. I was cold. I was wobbly. I was hating the world. And I was even considering giving up. It was at that point, a gentleman about my age, maybe a little older, passed me on the course. And that in itself wasn't impressive as I was getting passed by many people all, all day. What stood out about this gentleman was that he was wearing a Wounded Warrior Project jersey on, had an army unit patch on his hat, and was carrying a full-size American flag on a pole. What he was also wearing was a blade as a leg from the knee down. I was immediately both proud and ashamed at the same time. I was proud to see this hero giving it his all, knowing the hell he must have gone through when he lost that leg. And I was ashamed of me for feeling sorry for myself and my thoughts of quitting. Here was a hero that lost a leg in battle. And who knows what other scars he carries. And he was powering through and he was passing me with my two strong, healthy legs. It was the motivation and inspiration that drove me to finish the race, and I finished strong. Never again would I feel sorry for myself on a race course. I tried to find this gentleman at the, at the finish line after the race to thank him, not only for his service, but for what he'd done for me that day. Oh, and my wife did qualify for the Boston Marathon. Because of that nameless hero, I also decided that day that I was going to start raising money for the Wounded Warriors. The following year, my wife and I ran 32 half and full marathons and ran on the Wounded Warrior Project team in the Marine Corps Marathon. And we raised over $25,000 for them that year. Since then, we've run close to 100 half marathons and a dozen full marathons, all for Wounded Warrior first responder charities. And as I said before, we've raised close to $200,000 and we're not done yet. I've seen many heroes on the race courses over the years, many even racing them in wheelchairs and with double blades. But I always look for that one gentleman that passed me during that first one. So I can thank that hero and let him know how he's still serving his nation without even knowing it. Thank you all for your service. And God bless you. And thank you for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Evans. <laughs> what, no music? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I hope it's very, very clear that we are here to honor you. And we just, again, you're going to hear me say it several times probably to say thank you for your service. Today, our keynote speaker is Chris Peranto. 
He is a former Army Ranger and private security contractor. Chris, or Tonto Peranto, as he is affectionately known in security contracting circles, was part of the security team that responded to the terrorist attack on the U.S. Special Mission in Benghazi, Libya on September 11, 2012. For more than 13 hours, he and his team heroically fought terrorists, helping to save over 20 lives. His story is depicted in the book, 13 Hours, which later in 2016 became a motion picture. When we contacted Chris, it was obvious that he chose to be here with you all. He said, yes, I'll show up. And the reason I wanted to bring that up is because today is his wife Tanya's birthday. As it happens, she's here too. <laughs> Happy birthday. As I was talking to her in the back, and I said, so let me get this right. You asked Tanya what she wanted to do for her birthday, and she said, go to Shreveport? Is that the? Not exactly. OK. An American hero who exemplifies patriotism, selflessness, courage, Chris offers a captivating account of what happened in Benghazi on that historic day and a powerful perspective on leadership, harnessing one's inner strength, and the importance of strong teamwork in a perilous situation. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm Shreveport Bossier City welcome to Chris Tonto Peranto. I think you're good. Thank, thank you again. I appreciate it, sir. I really do. Thank you. And thanks for embarrassing my wife, too. That was awesome. Uh, uh, thank you, guys. Uh, no, I appreciate it. Now sit down, sit down, sit down. Wow. I heard that this is like where the Elvis left the building. Is that the history of this? That's cool. Can I? Is it this? No, it's this way. I, can't, I won't even try to imitate the king. I can't do that. He's out. See what he did? See what he did? He's like, hell no. I don't have a cell phone either, guys. I don't know what that was. It's OK. If that happens, guys, don't freak out. This just a Hellfire missile coming in because I'm telling the truth again. I'm kidding. Don't worry about that either. All of you veterans really get that. Everybody else, I didn't say that. I didn't say a word. All right? Um, Hey guys, I, I appreciate y'all coming, and it is for a great event. It really is. Um, you know, the, the Evans Financial to put this on and, and the tickets for free. I'm glad they did give them for free because probably nobody showed up. <laughs> if they wouldn't for because of me, I, I doubt it. Um, it. But I do appreciate, you know, and, and I think it's a big deal because veterans, you know, they, they gave all. Some, you know, I, you know all, all gave some, some gave all. I know I have buddies that have done that as well. So um, it, it does mean a lot, and it means a lot that you just even come spend some time with me and, and with my family and, and my wife. I'm glad she got embarrassed. Yeah, I'm going to pay for that later. Um, it wasn't me, though, I swear. He, Mr. Evans did that on his own. Um, but I, I just want to say thank you for being here, first of all. And then as I talk, I, I, and I do talk about Libya and Benghazi, and I, I kind of reflect back to some other things I went through as well. Um, when I was in Iraq and Afghanistan. I don't think people understand. I, I think they think Benghazi is the only thing I ever did, and it wasn't. I actually spent over 11 years deploying 10 years of that before Benghazi even happened. A lot of mistakes I made, a lot of things I did wrong that honestly saved me that night because I got to understand how to deal with adversity. I was thrown out of the military first time I was there. First time I was in the Army, I served for almost a year and a half, and <laughs> I screwed up. I got booted out. I was like, you're, you're gone. Luckily, I had a fantastic battalion commander by the name of Lieutenant Colonel McChrystal, Stanley McChrystal, and I had a great uh, commander as far as his name was uh, Captain LeCamera and Sergeant Major First Sergeant Grippy, who managed to get the paperwork set just right where I wasn't permanently kicked out. I could get back in if I had waiver after waiver after waiver to get in, and I did, and I did it all over again. And I went through basic again. I didn't want to do jump refresher. I went through ranger and dock again. But what I was getting at is, that was an adversity that I went through, and I don't think it was meant to hurt me. It was God, and I'm going to talk about God. If you don't believe in God, that's fine. You don't have to. A good Christian is going to tell you, hey, I believe in Christian. You don't have to. But what I'm going to tell you is they'll believe in something. There is faith. Have faith in something. There's something bigger than you all out there. I promise you that. 
But I don't think God was doing that to hurt me or to spite me. It was just a test and to have me deal with it. How can I overcome that obstacle? What do I do? Do I quit or do I press on? Well, shocker, come back to Benghazi, 9-11-2012. Do we quit and lay down because nobody's coming or do we press on? You'll go through adversity in your life and every day you're going to go through something like, ah, this sucks, this is awful, ah, this is terrible. How you deal with it? You can't affect what, you can't affect what happens. Really you can't. You, you make choices, it works. That bullet's down range, sometimes you miss the target. You can't take that bullet back. You re-aim, re-fire. But what you can't control is your attitude, how you feel about it. And that was a lot of that, well, what happened in Benghazi that night was attitude. It was, are we going to stay positive or are we going to just quit on ourselves? And luckily I had a team of warriors with me that felt the same way, and all of us were older at the time. We are all in our 40s, which is pretty old for uh, a guy that's still serving. All you young, you know, and then you got dang near E8s now at 36, and I was 42 at that time. Um, so we were lucky because we had all that experience. So when I talk about Benghazi, I'm not going to get into politics of it. That's been beat to death. I can't say any more than I've already said about what took place to politicians. They're either going to get reprimanded or they're not. Really, they will be reprimanded eventually. I don't need to see it. I just know one way or the other. And I think we've lost a little bit of focus on that because we, we want to see that public execution. I did two for two years. I was pushed that way. I don't mean public execution literally. I know some of you probably feel that way. I don't mean that literally, but I mean we want to see that punishment. We don't need to see it, guys. It's going to happen. And if you have faith, you know it's going to happen one way or the other. I know, and, I, and I'm back to being what I was before all Benghazi happened, before I went down that rabbit hole and started getting angry at everything all the time. And I'm happier now. And actually, my speaking is a lot better now because I'm not angry. So when I talk about Benghazi and I talk to you about that night, it's more about leadership, overcoming obstacles, dealing with adversity like I talked about. And it's about faith, and it's about God. It really is. And it's about never giving up, never quitting on yourself, your teammates, or your family, or anybody. That's Benghazi. And that's what the story's about. So I'm going to get into it. We'll roll a little bit. And if, here are things as far as ground rules for me. If I start to bore you, that's fine. Get up and walk out. It doesn't bother me at all. Believe me, I've spoken in Southern California a few times, and I've pissed off a couple people here. They get up and walk out. And literally, that's not bad. It's usually one or two. That's it. Which you'd be shocked. Even in, this, in New York City, New Jersey, I'll get one or two. Yeah, I'm not really having this. Uh, and that's fine. It doesn't offend me at all. If, if uh, I'm not politically correct, so if I say something that offends you, I doubt it in this room. I seriously doubt it. But if I do, I don't care. You can leave. I don't care about that. I'll offend you left and right. There's exits everywhere. Just, just go. But I hope at the end of the talk, I hope you just get something out of this. I hope they get something out of this and maybe can help you through maybe trials that you're going on in your, through your life. We all make mistakes. We all do. Everybody makes mistakes. I made a ton of them. I wrote two books about how many mistakes I've made. I mean, that was kind of embarrassing, but I hope people learn from them. So if you're going through a hard time, you know you can come out the other side. It's going to be okay. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. It just may be a few years down the road. It's all right. You don't have to be fast food anymore. Sometimes it's a marathon. You just got to keep pushing along, push along. Well, anyway, 9-11-2012, I had a fantastic team. I had a team of two Navy SEALs, Jack Silva, who was SEAL Team 5, Tyrone Woods, who passed away that night. We called him Roan. He was SEAL Team 6, former. We all were former. We all were out of the military. All of us were contractors at that time, security contractors directly hired by the CIA. And then I also had three Marines. I like to sometimes say former Marines because it pisses you Marines off in the audience, and that's what I get. Rangers, we love doing that. I hate I love it. But it's all in jest. I love you. But I'm not going to do that today because um, it's, it's, it's my wife's birthday. So I, I can't do that. <laughs> but I know we had three Marines. They were great guys. Oz, Mark Oz guys. You might have seen him on TV a few times. Great guy. Uh, John Tig Tigan. Big Tig. I love Tig. Big old country boy. He's still as big and he's still country as ever. And we had uh, DB Dave Boone Benton. And then you had myself. I was an Army Ranger with the 2nd second, uh, second Ranger Battalion. 2nd Battalion, 7th 5th Ranger Regiment is who I served with. And all of us had been contractors, like I said before, for quite a few years. All of us had been deploying for 10 plus years at that point. I don't think that was a coincidence either. I honestly think that if that would have happened and all of us would have had less time in, been less experienced, I think the outcome would have been different. Because we were able to hold it together because we had that experience. We'd been through a lot before. Experience is the best teacher. Hey, I, I've got a master's degree. I almost have two. And I'll tell you what, I never learned as much in school than I did at actually out there performing the job or being out there on the street, per se. Experience is the key. Book smart's great. But dang, street smart's, that trumps everything. 
Well, that team had a lot of street smarts. So when we got attacked at, or I say we got attacked, the consulate, the U.S. State Department facility, now we didn't have any, uh, I shouldn't say we, we had service to them because they were Americans, but we weren't working for the State Department. When he got attacked at 9-11-2012, I remember I heard some gunfire going on. And you kind of get used to the gunfire, especially you guys have all worked in the Middle East or Libya, I would consider the Middle East even though it's North Africa. Um, you hear that gunfire and you just get so acclimated to it because they're shooting their guns up in the air for anything. I mean, a red light works, a street light works in the middle of the city. Ah, oh, yeah, he's in, you know, mashallah, we're going to shoot our guns up in the air. It's just how it is. So when we got the call at 9-11, and we got the call, it was about 9-32 on our radio, 21-32 for you Marines out there. That's just so you understand. Military time. Okay. Love you guys. 21-32, we got that call. I remember, it was from our GRS team leader. That's what we're called, Global Response Staff, GRS. He says, GRS, we need you in the team room. I remember the first thing I did is I looked at Boone. And Boone, first thing he said to me, and that's why I'm smiling, because it was funny. He says, Tano, what'd you do now? If you've watched the movie 13 Hours, Pablo Schreiber, the guy that played me in the movie, plays me spot on. I mean, that, that is me, exactly me. He's just like a monster. He's huge. He's like 6'3", 235, 240. He's jacked. He's not as good looking as me, though, so I thought it was a pretty fair trade-off. I'm a lot better looking, even with my wrinkles. I'm still getting better. But I remember Boone looked at me because I got used to playing practical jokes on whoever. It didn't matter who it was. I, I, I did practical jokes on especially CIA case officers because they're all college kids coming in. All of them had these book smarts. And all of them thought they were Jason Bourne, but they weren't. So I had to, you know, got to poke at him a little bit. So that's why Boone says, what'd you do? There's a reason we also do some references to Tropic Thunder in 13 hours. You know, the, probably the second greatest war movie ever made behind 13 hours. Tropic Thunder's fantastic. <laughs> well, the reason we did it is because one of the jokes I used to play on the CIA case officers is I had a little piece of paper that had laminated it, and I took it to every base. And it was from that scene in the movie. I actually got banned from Twitter for saying this once. But it was from that scene in the movie where Ben Stiller and Robert Downey Jr. are talking to each other, and he says that famous line, never go full retard, right? That's what he says. Well, I had it on a piece of paper, and I had it laminated, and it was said, never go full retard on it. And I had his picture of Sergeant Cyrus O'Malley, I think his name was, in Tropic Thunder, looking like this. So it got that dumb look on his face. And so whenever a case officer, a CI case officer, do something stupid, I put it on their desk. That's the first thing they see in the morning. And, of course, they get us all in trouble, because Ivy Leaguers don't like to see that first thing in the morning when they come in. But there also was a reason I'd do it as well. It wasn't just to poke fun. It was to test. How would they react? Can they handle a joke? We're in a combat zone. We're in a war zone. I need you to be able to handle yourself, even if the stress levels or your pissed off levels go up a little bit. How are you going to handle that? And if you got so pissed off over that little joke I was playing, I knew that you weren't going to be able to handle yourself in combat. Ranger Battalion, when you're a private, we get hazed. We get made fun of and hazed and beat all the time. And there's a lot of attrition. There's quitters left and right. Everybody's quitting. That's all right. But you've got to be able to handle yourself. If you can't handle a little joke, how are you going to handle it when somebody starts shooting at you? There, is, there, there really is a mindset there. How are you going to deal with that? That's why I did it. And it was also kind of fun to make fun of them. That's me. And I was right. The ones that couldn't handle that joke, they literally, excuse my language, and I won't say the yes, but they crapped on themselves that night. There's a test to that. So if you're working with people, you know, I don't say you need to go make fun of them or anything like that. All I mean, just a little rib every once in a while. See if they can handle it. Push them a little bit when you're training them push them. I got pushed hard. Because if they're going to fail on you in training, they're going to fail on you when you really need them. And I'd rather have 10 hardcore people quality over 100 that are going to quit on me when the going gets tough. Well, Boone looks at me. That's why he said, Tano, what'd you do? I remember I thought to him for a second, the 9 -11, back to 9-11. I said, Boone, I ain't done anything. I've been a good, good boy all day. I had. 30 seconds later, though, we do get a more urgent call. It's from our GRS team leader, Global Response Staff team leader. He says, GRS, we need you in the team room now. And I remember I looked at Boone, and he's smiling. And I say to him, because I can read his thoughts, because we've been working together for a long time at that point. Probably about, we've been started at Blackwater. We were the first class at Blackwater, actually, in 2004. And I remember I looked at him, and I said, we could do something fun tonight. And I smiled just like that smile you're seeing on me now, because I'm remembering that. And it's so vivid, still in my head. And we headed out the door. We got our gear, and we headed out of our little hooch. And he said, get out of the hooch. I can already see the firefight. You can see the tracers going up in the air. Tracers, a bullet that burns. A lot of you guys that have served, you know what that is. It's a bullet that burns because, luckily for us, one of the reasons we are still the greatest fighting force in the world is because we have night vision. 
We don't need bullets that burn to direct fire. We can actually see bullets at night. We have infrared laser po lasers on our guns, and it's, it's awesome. Our enemy doesn't have that, so they still use tracers. Orange, green, depending on the size of the, uh, the, size of the round that's going, whether it's a PKM round, which is a machine gun at 7.62. For you hunters out there, it's a 308 size cartridge, 308 round. Or if it's a AK-47 round, which is a little bit smaller, 7.62 round. And I'm just watching that firefight, and it's, it's, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's, watching firefights is the most beautiful thing you can ever see. If you ever allow yourself to put yourself in that moment, I, I just could. I've been able to do that over the years and just enjoy it. And the reason I was able to enjoy those situations is because I was never worried that I was going to die. You know, as long as I'm doing the right thing, God's going to take care of me. And I knew I might. I wasn't saying that. I'm not, I, I'm, believe me, I'm no Sergeant York. Look at me. I'm 160 pounds dripping wet, if that. I just accepted the fact that God had me in that position. That's why I needed to be there. This is why I'm here. He knows what he knows. He knows what's best for me. It's okay. I'm here. Drive on. Let's move towards that contact or move towards that threat or whatever we need to do at that point in time. This is where I need to do. Thank you, Lord, for putting me here. That's how it was. And you could just enjoy anything. It was awesome because the world just, it's kind of like you have blinders like you're a racehorse. And when you accept that, your world just goes, oh. And you need your world to go like this, especially when you're in a firefight or in any stressful situation. You need to see everything. But you're also able to enjoy everything, and it's awesome. It's freaking awesome. Well, we start moving. I remember the team's moving, and we're moving, and I see a team of leaders. Nobody's saying a word. That's how I know we've got a team of leaders, because everybody has a responsibility, and everybody is doing their job. Everybody is moving and doing their specific tasks that each of one of us has. Roan's our 18 Delta. He's going to get our med bag. He's our, he's our medic. He's our, he's our surgeon on the battlefield. And our team, our, actually, he was our assistant team leader, but we put him our team leader in the movie because we didn't portray our actual team leader in the movie. He's in the book 13 hours, but not in the movie because he was worthless anyway. Really, Ron was our team leader. <laughs> Jack was going to go get his vehicle. He's getting his, getting his weapon. Tig's getting his weapon system, getting his 203, or a grenade launcher. Shoots little golden eggs, high, high explosive direct penetrator rounds, little golden eggs. He's getting our 203. Boone's getting my vehicle because he's, he's uh, got to get it staged even though I'm driving it. And, of course, I'm the biggest. I mean, uh, I'm sorry. I wish. I'm the smallest guy on the team, so I get, a, of course, the machine gun, right? <laughs> Isn't that how it works? All you guys that served, the smallest guy is always the machine gunner gets the biggest, heaviest weapon. And I'm getting my stuff, and it's awesome. Five minutes, we're ready to go. Five minutes, we're good. Let's go. And I remember I looked at Tyrone. He's at his vehicle at his door. I'm not going to my SUV. My door's open, so I'm walking to it. And I just go like this to him. He goes like this back. And it's time to go. I go to my team leader, who's here, my chief of, chief of base, Bob, who's here. If you guys have watched the movie, you know who Bob is. And I say, we're ready to go. Chief looks at the team leader. Team leader looks at him. They look at each other again a few times. And I'm like, hey, we, we're ready to go. Chief looks at me and says, tell these guys they need to wait. He was actually talking to my Jira's team leader. He wasn't really talking to me. It's kind of like a slap in the face. Team leader actually has the balls, excuse me, the huevos, the, the cojones. He actually has the, the brass to call, look at me and say, hey, you guys need it. And I stop and I go, I got it, man. I got it. And I walk back to my car. As I'm walking back to my car, Ron's going, Tano, what's going on? I says, Bob, we've got to wait. And that's hard to do because the team at the State Department facility with Ambassador Chris Stevens, you can hear and see the firefight. You can hear their RPGs start to hit. The rock and pill grenades start to go boom, boom when they hit. You can start hearing the lower rate of fire from a heavier weapon system, a dishka. And you know they're just getting hammered. And I'm still watching the firefight. I mean, you're just seeing it. And now we're starting to hear them on the radio because we share the same frequencies with them. And on our ICOM radios, we can hear Alec Henderson, who has barricaded himself in that tactical operations center there at the consulate. He's watching his team on, on close camera TVs, CCTVs. And he's calling us on the radio going, GRS, where are you? GRS, we need you here. GRS, and I, I can't simulate even the panic in his voice. Those of you who have taken panic calls over a radio, it almost sounds ghostly. It's eerie. Because you know there's bad things going on. It just sounds different on a radio, on a, on a hit in an earpiece. And it's bad because we know they're getting... They're dying. We know it. We can't do anything. So you have to hold it together. Now, like I said, I used to play those jokes on the CAK officers. These guys are freaking out now. They're all, it's like they're cats, chickens with their heads cut off. They're running everywhere. 
the team is just remaining calm. I know everybody inside just going crazy. There's crazy, but you're holding it together. And how I hold it together, and how I used to train myself so I didn't freak out and start getting angry like I did in the early stages of my career, is I would what we call what if. I'd war game in my head. Okay, minutes gone by, what do I do now? Okay, another minute's gone by, what's the next step? What do we have to do? Once we get out this gate, what could we run into? How do we handle that? What about this next step? What if we get ambushed halfway down? What do we do at that point? I'm going through different scenarios and situations in my head, either from training or from past experiences and how we dealt with it. Because I was still alive, so obviously we dealt with it correctly at that time. That's why I tell you folks, if you work with somebody or you work in a unit or you're working in an office, it doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're law enforcement, whether you're still in the military, you push your people hard in training. So when that stuff goes down and they have to sit on their hands because somebody up higher is telling them they can't go, they don't freak out and get angry and they go what we call in the black, Colonel Cooper's color codes. They go in the black and they shut down. Or they go in the red completely and they're way out of control. They're just spinning out of control. It's like a four-wheel drive stuck in mud and they're doing nothing. You take a breath and you just start thinking. War game, what if? What if, what if this happens? What if this happens? And then you go through the scenario. And then you're not surprised if it does happen once you get out that gate or wherever you have to go. And as that five minutes turns to 10 minutes and that turns to 15 minutes now that we're waiting and we're watching, it's just knowing that they're dead. And now we know basically that this is gonna turn into a suicide mission. We, we, we feel it. You know, we're letting them take the initiative. We've lost the initiative. Any initiative that we may have had is gone. I remember hearing Alec Henderson on the radio say, GRS, you swore you'd get here. That hurt, that really did, because we did. We all serve, I believe so, in the military, and I do believe so as first responders as well, with the credo or verse, John 15, 13, and I'll paraphrase it, it's not exact, but love is no greater than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. What that means is that selfless service. It means that you're willing to give your life for someone else. Now, that's what it is in the services. That's what it should be in first responders, that's what it should be as a, in a law enforcement officer as well, but it's also in your everyday life should always be selfless. Never selfish. Selfless as even as, and this is a pet peeve of mine, and I always, pisses me off because this is selfishness to me. It's as simple as this. When I'm at a coffee place and I go to pick up that half and half to fill my coffee mug and it's empty because that last person was selfish and didn't turn it back into the barista, that's the same thing. It doesn't have to be as I got to give my life for somebody else. It's like, I'm going to think of my fellow man before. I always do it. It makes me mad. Would you leave a half, a half a drink in the refrigerator when you're at home? Wouldn't your mom kick your butt when you're awake? That's what happened in my house. Why you got to do it somewhere else? But that's what I'm saying. It doesn't have to be, I'm going to give my life for somebody else. It's just, I'm going to think of somebody else before me. But at that point, that's what it is in Benghazi. We got to get out that gate. We swore we'd get there. Now we're going regardless. We're Marines, Rangers, and SEALs. We're coming to help. We leave nobody behind. But when he said it, it felt like we were going back on our words. If you go back to the movie 13 Hours and you see the scene where Pablo Schreiber, again, awesome, I know it's exact, we're doing this risk assessment of the consulate. We're walking around the U.S. consulate looking at the security assessment, and you see me, smart-ass Tano, up there on the stage, up there on the diving board is really what it was, diving board. I'm looking, my, got my Copenhagen in. Don't chew, guys. My gums are de deteriorated. I don't condone chewing at all. Tobacco is bad, very bad. You can dip if you want. Anybody got Copenhagen, actually? You got me, so. <laughs> But I remember Pablo, and I remember doing that, I put my Copenhagen in. And I'm, this is probably about a month before the attack. And I look at Alec, and I look at Scott, and I look at Dave. These are the State Department officers. Dave got blown up that night. He did it very well until he got hit with a mortar that night. But I remember looking at him going, guys, look at your walls. These things are soft. This is a sniper's paradise. You've got a building that overlooks this compound. 17th Feb Mars Brigade, they're not your friend. That's a terrorist organization. You guys get attacked by any big element, you're all going to F and die. And I remember when I said that, I think I just scared the bejesus out of Scott because his eyes came out like this and he came back in. And I thought to myself, man, I made a mistake. This one time where I shouldn't have said that. You don't tell the civilian they're going to die in the Middle East or North Africa. I set him up for failure right there. So I re-engaged my frontal lobe filter. I put it in my head. And I looked back at Alec. I looked at Scott and looked at Dave. I said, if you ever need us, we'll come get you. And we swore we'd get him. So come back 9-11-2012 when we hear Alec say, Jirosh, you swore you'd get here. That's why it cut, my, cut me, and I know it cut the team to the bone. Well, we knew we were going to have to leave. Man's law is gone. Now it's God's law. That's where we're going. 
We know we're going to get fired, which we did. We, actually, our security clearances got suspended. We got fired. We knew that if we got killed over there, our insurance wouldn't kick in. We have Defense Base Act insurance. If we disobey orders, we don't have no life insurance or health insurance. We get no insurance if we get injured. Doesn't matter. It's the right thing to do. The 25-minute mark of us waiting to go, we hear Alec Henderson say, GRS, if you don't get here, we're all going to F and die. And that's when I remember I saw the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And I've been doing a lot of stuff at that point. I saw Tyrone crack his door. So he's driving his sedan. He cracks his door a little bit. And he, Tyrone was a monster. He looked like Leonidas from 300. The dude was jacked. And I remember SEAL Team 6 Tyrone just go like this. <laughs> I still get chills thinking about it, because I'm like, how awesome is this? I get to go to combat with Leonidas. This is freaking awesome. And I remember I gave a thumbs up through my car window. And we headed out the door. As we head out the door, we're starting to move. We're starting to move out that gate, out the front door, the front gate of the compound. I'm thinking because I've been what ifing the whole time in my head that we need stuff, that we're forgetting something. I did feel like we forgot something. And I remember we need our interpreter. We need Henry. We call him a mom in the movie. He looked great in the movie. He didn't look like that in real life. He looked like Bob Newhart from Egypt, is actually what he looked like. <laughs> he was adorable. And not the young Bob Newhart. He looked like the older Bob Newhart in the Daryl series, you know, brother Daryl, Daryl, that, that Bob Newhart. He was adorable, though, the cutest little thing. But I know we need him. I've been through that situation before, where there's a language barrier, and you end up shooting each other up, even though you're friendly forces, because you're not speaking the same language. Blue on green incident is what we call it. And I'm trying to reach him on the radio. I'm saying, Henry, we need you. Henry, where are you? Henry, we need you. I need you here now. Get in my vehicle. I can't reach him. Always have faith. Always have faith. It's amazing how a little bit of faith will increase your luck every time. It's just amazing that how that coincidence works. I have faith that I'm going to find him. I'm pissed. I'm angry because now I have to waste more time. And I say, stop the cars. i got to find Henry. We stop. I crack the door. I get out of the vehicle. As I'm coming around the front of the hood, thinking I'm going to have to wait another 10 minutes to try to find Henry, he's walking right there. Have faith. I go, dude, we need you. Little Bob Newhart looked at me like a little deer. He's just a little doe. His eyes were just monstrous, huge, because he knows what I'm going to ask him. I go, we need you, man. He goes, Tom, I'm not a combat turp. I'm not weapons qualified. I took my pistol out. I handed it to him. I said, you are now. Go get your stuff. And he was the most brave man that night out of all of us, that little guy. He took my pistol. He did a 180. He ran back into building C where all of our gear was. Now, Boone had got out of our vehicle, and he's just leaning on it, cool as a cucumber, just shaking his head at me like this. And I remember looking at him. I knew what he was thinking, too. I go, I just lost my pistol, right? He ain't coming back, is he? <laughs> but 30 seconds later, I see Bob Newhart come out, and he's running at me. And his helmet, I could have swore that thing was on backwards. It was just so large, it didn't even fit him. Because he didn't have his own gear. He's not supposed to go out the gate. He's not, he's not a combat trip. He's a linguist. His body armor fit him in the movie. It didn't in real life. It was down to here. It was like a little mini skirt. So all I see is this little Egyptian turtle running around. And the funnier thing is that he doesn't have any, he's not, he doesn't know how to handle weapons. So guess what he's doing with that pistol the whole time he's running? Just flagging everybody. I'm sitting there going, dude, stop. I'm trying to dodge the thing. But I'm smiling, and I'm just, it's, because it is, it's, it's so comical, it's funny. You'd be shocked how funny combat can be, how, hot, how much humor is involved. Laughter is always the best medicine, and I'm just like, stop, point your gun, dude. As he gets to the car, I said, get in my car, you adorable little guy. And I put him in the back seat, and we head out the gate. And we shoot out the gate. Jack, I remember him, he said, because he, he said, actually said this when we did the book, 13 Hours. Jack actually looked at the turtles, because we had a pet, bunch of pet turtles in the center of our compound. The movie did a pretty good job showing how actually how the annex looked. It was almost identical. But I remember he said, I looked at them turtles for the last time. We all thought that, not that we're going to die, we're not giving up, but it's like, man, this could be it. Go. Selfless service. Doesn't matter. Drive on. Let's keep pushing forward. You never quit. We moved, and we kept moving, and we got there. We got 400 meters from the U.S. consulate, or the special mission compound, or the temporary mission facility, or whatever you want to call it. I always call it the U.S. consulate. We're in a road called Gunfighter. We get down. We're supposed to bang a right. So as we go down this road, bang a right, 400 meters, there's the front of the U.S. consulate. We're there. We get the ambassador out. We're done, right? No. We lost the initiative. There's people shooting everywhere. There's a little local force that's basically running around with their heads cut off that we thought we were supposed to link up with, but we couldn't tell. Nobody wore uniforms. There's a couple guys shooting back down the road where we're supposed to go. 
So we stop our cars. And I remember I looked at Henry. I said, dude, get this figured out. And as we start to get out of our cars, guns up, I'm looking. There's a couple guys shooting back down the road, but everybody, all these other local force that we're supposed to link up with, I think, they're running around freaking out. They're not doing anything. And Boone's stating the obvious because that's what he always did. He goes, we waited 25 minutes for these guys? I'm like, yeah. And as we get closer, so there's this eight-foot-high block wall. As we move closer, so my car stopped right here. I got out of my car, and I'm moving towards that block wall, gun up. Tyrone's already moving. Jack's already moving. Ty Tig's already moving. You start hearing snaps as we get closer to that block wall, that opening, basically that avenue of approach. Well, what the snaps are, it sounds like a whip crack, and it's when a high-velocity round goes by your head, it breaks a sound barrier. Some of you guys that have been in combat, you know that, or you've been shot at before by a high-power rifle, you know what that snap is. And it sounds like a whip crack. It goes crack, 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 And then it'll stop, and then it'll go crack, 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 crack. And it's freaking awesome. It is, it is awesome. I think the Evans have Red River Gun Club, right? We should do that tonight. After the, well, you go stand down to the end range, I'll shoot by your heads. <laughs> or maybe tomorrow morning if you drink too much because it'll sober you up like that. I'm telling you what. Like, well, but it's awesome. And I think it's awesome too because it's not me by myself. I'm with a team of leaders. And every one of them is not saying a word. They're all moving into position to engage. Confidence breeds confidence just like panic breeds panic. I'm staying confident because my team is staying confident and cool and collected. So I'm able to handle myself. It makes me stronger. Teamwork, always. Well, I remember I get out of my car, and I'm moving to engage, and Boone says, Tano, let's get high. Boone's our sniper. He's got our 308 rifle. He's like, roger that. What are we going to do? He says, we need to break off. So we broke off. The movie's spot on. We split at that point. Roan and Tig and Jack went down the main road. They pushed forward. Me and Boone just started playing hide-and-go-seat going through backyards. And I remember that first hill or that first eight-foot-high wall I jumped up on to get over the top because every, <laughs> every neighborhood, every house there is basically its own compound. There's eight foot high block walls in every, every backyard. I pulled up and I got my helmet on, I got my night vision on, I got my armor on, I got my machine gun on this side. I can't tell you the nomenclature of it because I, it's secure. I can put it on an open server. You guys can probably see it that way. That's my only political thing I'm going to say. That's a, the whole night. <laughs> I have my M4 on this side. I had a two and a round drum, an extra belt, belt of drum of ammunition, and I had M4 magazines all over myself. I was wearing shorts that night. That wasn't a dramatization. I still have those shorts. I'll sell them on eBay one of these days. You don't, don't want them. Yeah, I'll tell you why later. <laughs> I also was wearing a Mickey Mouse shirt that night, too, but I couldn't put it in the show in 13 hours. I guess Michael Eisner didn't want Mickey Mouse shooting terrorists that night, but I'll tell you what, I don't know what more America than that is, to be honest with you. <laughs> So I had a Mickey Mouse shirt, shorts, and I remember I pulled myself up on that first wall, and it was hard. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not used to this. I'm not, I'm, I haven't been working out enough. And I thought back to ranger school when I went through Mountain Face. I remember I was already emaciated by the time I got to Mountain Face. People don't realize you don't just go right into ranger school. You go to pre-ranger, then you usually have two, maybe even three weeks of what we call zero and wrap week before you'll go to bending phase, which is three weeks if you pass it. So by even if you pass everything right off first, you're still basically, before you even get to mountain phase, which is the middle, you've already been in ranger school for a month and a half. And I remember I was tired going up Mount Yona. And I had a 70 pound pack on. I don't think it was any heavier than that. It felt heavier, but I don't think it was more than 70 pounds. And I remember going up Mount Yona at ranger school, thinking, I'm not gonna make it. I'm not gonna make it. And this our eyes behind me, ranger search are going, you better get your, get your butt up that hill, ranger. You're done, you're done, you're out. I'm like, I can't quit. I can't go back and without my tab. I can't go back. It'll kick me out of range battalion. And I willed myself up that hill. So come back up to 9-11, pull over those walls. I go, I can do this. I, it's, it's mind over matter. My mind's going to tell my body it can't do it. If I tell my mind, yes, you tell your body you can do it, you're going to be able to do it. And I tell you what, the pain went away. It's like, I'm good. And I just kept going over wall after wall, playing the ultimate game of hide and go seek. It's... When you go through backyard, you do urbanized training or any urban fighting, you want to go through doorways and holes. We just, we didn't have explosives to bowl holes, and we couldn't, not every compound had a back gate you could go through. So it was climbing over walls. And it is, because if you get caught in this ultimate game of hide-and-go-seek, there ain't going back to start and starting over. You're, you're dead. But you press on. You don't quit. As we move, and it took us about 30 minutes to get there. So we was 400 meters of us fighting. We split. 
It took us 30 minutes to go that 400 meters to finally get there. I remember me and Boone also went up two buildings. The movie shows us clearing one building. We actually cleared two. There had to get sniper fire in the middle of that consulate. But every time we went up to it, the roost was a bust because the only trees in all of Benghazi were on the consulate and they were all on fire. So it was just blocking everything. Well, I remember as we got on the front of that consulate, it's probably about 11 o'clock. It's been over an hour and a half since we got called. I come over that back gate. As I come to that back gate, I see the land cruisers on fire. I see the buildings on fire. I see just chaos everywhere. Roan's already on the gate. He's, I can already see him starting to go in that burning villa trying to save and find the ambassador. And again, <clears throat> all I can see is just how gorgeous it is. There's no fear. It's adrenaline. I'm not saying I'm not scared at some points. I did get scared at some points that night, but it's, it's adrenaline. Fear or not, adrenaline, fight or flight. How to use that adrenaline. You just push it out to your hands and arms and legs. You just push that stuff out. It's the same thing. You don't let it overtake you. If you let it overtake you as fear, well, then, yeah, you're going you're gonna to quit. If you don't, gosh, just, that's why us veterans have sometimes have a hard time coming back home. Because we can't see that, we don't see that life anymore, that just those colors that we're able to absorb and see and enjoy and all this stuff that you're able to see overseas if you allow yourself to, if you don't go into this tunnel vision, which is hard to not do, you have to fight it. But once you're able to experience that, it is difficult to come back because it's hard to experience those vivid colors again, the sounds and smells. But I remember we did, and we cleared that compound. We got on there, and for the next hour, we're clearing this nine-acre compound. That's about three football field size. And I remember about 11.30-ish, we found a few of the survivors, some of the State Department officers. And in between, we're trying to still find the ambassador in that burning villa. And it's tough, because every time you try to run in there, and I admire you firefighters, fire's awful. I'd rather get shot at than run into a fire burning building ever again, especially what I was wearing. I remember hitting just a wall when I ran into that building. Didn't even, it's like an invisible wall of diesel smoke and fumes and fire. And just go, whoa, that hurt. And then just going, OK, I can do it. And sucking it up and going in. But in between those times of us taking turns going in, trying to find the ambassador. And Jack and Tyrone went in the most, and TIG. But I took a few turns in there. When I wasn't, I was pulling security on the backside of the ambassador's villa. So the ambassador's villa is on fire. I'm on this wall here pulling security because one of the local guards left the back gate open. So as I'm doing this, I'm pulling security. Boom comes behind me. And he's angry. He's pissed. The Marine is fired up. He's like, that SOB, that mother effer, that if he just would have let us leave on time. And it's kind of worrying me because Boone doesn't get like that. He's pretty low key. He's pretty stable most of the time. And when I turn him, I go, dude, what happened? He goes, we lost one. Any of y'all that have lost friends or buddies or even just acquaintances in a situation, you don't want to hear that. That sucks. It's part of life, but that sucks. <laughs> and I look at him, and he's, he's angry. So I thought we lost one of the teammates. I was like, man. So I look, I'm like, dude, who we lose? Who we lose? He goes, IT guy. And I still feel bad to this day. I couldn't remember who that was for about the first 30 seconds. I was like, who's the IT guy? And then it hit me. I'm like, oh, that's Sean. Damn, we lost Sean. War's finicky. Life's finicky. Ten years I've been doing stuff like that. I, I've been blown, I've been blown up. I've been shot at, never been hit. My blown up were from far away. I caught a little bit. I've never been seriously injured. I've been very lucky. Sean's been in combat, not even in combat. He's just been in a combat situation for two days and he's dead. It's just life, guys. You just have to suck up. You can't quit on it. I couldn't quit at that point. Now quit. You can't give up. Boone's angry. And we can't have him angry because he can't focus if he's angry. Nobody can. You can't focus when you're all pissed off. And we need him. There's only six of us. And because he's a Marine, and you Marines know what I'm talking about. You know how I have to do to get him back into it? The knife hand, right? That's all I got to do. I just go, Sergeant. He uses his eyes. And he's a professional. I said, dude, you all right? He goes, I'm good, I'm good. I said, Roger that. He's back. You can see his eye. He's just back. He's back into the fight. And I run in the front of the compound. As I run, because he took security, and I'm running to see if I can help at the front of the compound with Sean or whoever else, I see Jack Silva, still Team 5 Jack, doing chest compressions on a dead body. Now, I don't know what demons go through Jack's head at night. I don't even envy those demons. But I, I admire him 
after I watched him, what he did. Sean's body's here, and he's doing this. I know he's dead. He, I know he's dead. It's obvious he's dead. Jack knows he's dead. Initially, though, I'm looking at him going, why in the world? And then I see what he's doing to, Alec, uh, to Scott Wickland, who's sitting here going into shock. Scott was the ambassador's body man who got out but lost control of the ambassador. Scott's on the, rocking on the steps going, he was just with me, he was just with me, he was just, and he's doing this continually, and he's starting to get faster and faster and just mumble to himself, well, he's going into shock. Can't have him go into shock. We don't have enough bodies to handle it, and a dead person, and now we have to handle somebody that's an injury. We call them the casualty. We don't have enough bodies. We're going to be combat ineffective. Jack knows that, so he's doing this, and every time he looks up, he goes, stay with me. We're still in this fight, brother. Stay with me. Jack is sacrificing his own mental state to get Scott back in the fight, and all I can do is look at it and just go, oh, how lucky am I to be here? I felt so blessed to be in that situation because of the guys that I was around. I was like, this is awesome. I see Tyrone, he comes out of nowhere and he puts his arm around Scott and he goes, brother, we're still in this fight. We need you for the rest of the night. Their little coaxing of staying positive in a situation that was completely, completely awful got Scott back in the fight. You could see his eyes come back. And that's when Tyrone comes to me and Jack after that, Jack and Dave Ubin, Dave did a very good job that night. Again, like I said, before he got blown up, they picked up Sean's body and they put him in the back of that SUV that we had there. And Tyrone comes up to me and Jack and go, guys, I hate to do this to you, but they forgot all their classified information. You guys got to go back and get it. So me and Jack <clears throat> turn and run over there. And I remember as we're cutting wires and we're getting all the classified information out, because we don't know really what's classified, and we don't have thermite or incendiary grenades, or we would just throw one in there and blown that whole thing up because we hadn't been through the CIA, pulled the pin through the grenade course, even though we've been throwing grenades for probably about 18 years. <laughs> but we weren't government certified by the CIA. <laughs> yes, I know, government. We started cutting wires and just grabbing all the class art information, getting all the computers, everything that we thought possibly could be classified, which was the electronic stuff. That was probably the movie we were thinking, well, that's got to be the most important stuff. And as we're running back, you see me and Jack with these computers and hard drives and bags of stuff over our arms, plus we have our weapon systems, plus we're covered in soot. Jack more so than me because he'd been going so much into that burning building. You see buildings burning, cars burning. You see, I'm Mexican, Jack is Portuguese, which is Mexican light, basically. So you're seeing us running. So you can imagine what we look like. We look like a couple of looters running through this carnage. And Jack can see that I'm just falling to lose it. I'm starting to drop. My energy levels are just going down. And Laughter is the best medicine. It really is. That's not just cliche. That's, that's for real. It's not a metaphor. Jack comes like this. He's running after me. And he looks at me. And he goes, and he thinks we all speak like Cheech Marin from Cheech and Chong. He goes, hey, man, doesn't look like we just robbed the Best Buy. And I about fell off. I laughing. <laughs> but it worked. It picked me up. It was amazing. It's just amazing how blessed I was to be with those guys that night. <laughs> well, we throw all the classroom information in the back of that SUV, and I go back, another SUV we had, and I go back and I pull security. At that point in time, Alec Henderson, Scott Wilkins, the State Department officers, we got them all. They're taking off the back gate, the movie's spot on. Jack and Tyron were telling them, when you got this back gate, you go left, do not go right. I even heard them on the radio, don't go Right, you need to go to gunfighter. Don't go to Adidas is what we call it. And then there's a huge explosion. So I'm on the back side of the villa right here again. I'm pulling security, and all of a sudden there's a boom. Now, it's far enough, and I'm out of position here. So it hits here. I'm over here. So I got no shrapnel. I catch a little bit of the overpressure, but it was one explosion. That's it. So my gun came out quick, and I see this Libyan come out of nowhere from the building, out of that corner. <clears throat> and he's running like this. So think of a carnival game. I'm just catching a profile. And he's running like this. His buddy comes out of nowhere as well, and he's chasing after him like this. And I'm laughing because the guy that's in the front holding his hand, well, there's no hand there. It's gone. After that explosion, the guy that's running behind him is holding pieces of his hand, chasing after him. And the reason I'm laughing is I'm going to myself. My brain's trying to wrap around this. My brain's going, dude, stop. You forgot your hand. Go back and get it. It's not insensitive, guys. It's war. I did have somebody in the audience one time say, oh, that's so insensitive. It, no, it's not. It's, it's, it's just war. Your brain is trying to wrap around all that, senses at the same time. 
And I go, all I could get out though, I didn't say that, I said, what happened? I couldn't think of anything to say, I just couldn't make my mouth work. And the guy with the holding his buddy's hand said, grenade, so I figured it was a grenade. Guy tried to cook it off, pulled the pin, held it for three seconds instead of two before he threw it out. So I'm thinking, oh, well, serves you right, don't throw grenades at this anymore. Just rip some dirt on it, you'll be all right, get out of here. <laughs> I go back, I take a knee again, all of a sudden there's a, this one is close, this one, boom, blows up and it knocks me down a little bit, then catch any shrapnel again, because I'm, it hits here and I'm on this side, so the shrapnel goes this way, I catch the overpressure from the explosion, and then the snaps start, and we're getting hit. And I remember I just, I was out in the open, and I didn't have time myself, I'm thinking, I don't have time to find cover. I need to start shooting through that back gate right now because they're coming as fast as they can. They're going to get through that gate, and then we're screwed. <clears throat> and I just started shooting as fast as I could. And I felt over. I hadn't felt like this every time I've been in a duress or stressful situation or been shot at. I have never, I, but I did that night. I felt like there was a golden cocoon over the top of me. I got you. I felt like I just said, here, I got you. You're good. It's awesome. As I'm shooting... I look in my right eardrum, blows out, and I look, and to my right, there's this little Libyan that came out of nowhere and took it right next to me, and I'm looking at his AK-47 muzzle, and it's shooting, and my hearing is just going, because it's just ringing. It hurts. But I'm looking, going, ain't this the damnedest thing? God just gave, gave me a little Libyan angel and put him right next to me. <laughs> and then I look, and Boone took a knee next to me, and he's shooting. And then I look up on the building, and it's almost, I, when I work on these, these buildings like this, it, it, it that's almost at the exact angle where the top of that villa was, the ambassador's villa was. I can see a Marine up there shooting. He's up on the building that's on fire. It was Tig. Tig got up there. When we got to Germany the next day, I wanted to ask Tig, because he's a Marine, and sometimes you brain, your guys' brain synapses. I think it's because you raise your hands into walls too much. They just don't fire correctly. <laughs> so I had to ask him. I said, you did realize that building was on fire, right? He goes, yeah. I go, why'd you get up there? He goes, it's a better firing position. I didn't want to let you guys down. I make fun of grunts. I do. I was a grunt in the infantry with, with the Rangers. Every Ranger were grunts. I make fun of Marine grunts a lot, but I always go to combat with them. I always will, because they will always put themselves out front. We fought them off. Long story short, movie does a great job showing that. <laughs> we get word now, because we do have a drone overhead, an ISR. It's telling us, get back to the annex, it's going to get overrun. You guys got to get out of there, or you're going to lose it. And we make a decision. As a leader, sometimes you have to make decisions that you will live with for the rest of your life, but you have to make that decision. And we left. We went back to the annex. Never leave a fallen comrade to fall in the hands of the enemy. That's part of the fifth standards of the Ranger Creed, and we violated that. We left the ambassador. <laughs> It still bothers me, but <clears throat> when you're in a leadership position, sometimes you have to make those tough decisions. If we wouldn't have left, we would have lost the annex and we would have lost 30 more people. It's okay, though. I will always tell you, leadership or not, when there's a decision to be made, make a decision. It's better to make a decision and work through possibly that being wrong than to make no decision at all and leave it up to chance. That's what Bob did. Well, we get back to the annex, and I remember as we get back to the annex, we go up to our fighting positions, and we know how to defend our own keep. So we're in our spots where we need to be, and we see these militia, militia. We see Ansar Sharia and Al-Qaeda and the Maghreb start to move on us. And I remember as they're moving on us, I'm looking through my night vision, and when you're in a combat situation or a battle situation, you have night vision, and they don't, it is so awesome. It's almost comical watching them move. Because you're like, I see you, I can see you. I don't know why you're moving and running from hiding from point to point. You're just going to die tired. Just stop running. <laughs> They're terrorist folks. If that offends you, then you really don't need to leave. But I remember just watching them, and they're moving. And I remember I'm going in for a laser. Every once in a while, I'm lazing a person just to make sure the whole team's on the same page. I'm like, you got that guy? You got that guy? And I'm getting word. Yep, copy, copy. I mean, we're, it was awesome. It was just, it was like... That team had been there for 30 days, and it was just like we were meant to be together. And the shocking thing is we don't all get along either. Me and Oz don't like each other. Boone and I have problems. 
But I tell people, you don't have to like somebody to be successful as a team. You just have to be able to get to that common goal, whatever it is, and work together and put your differences aside to accomplish that goal. That's how you're successful. I remember as they're moving towards us, I'm looking, and this guy gets close to Oz's position, and all of a sudden I see a fizz come over the back gate. And as I see it come over the back gate, it's like a wick of a stick of dynamite was lit. I mean, this is what it looked like in my night vision. Like somebody lick, lit a stick of dynamite, and it was shh. But as it goes over the position, I'm watching it, I'm following it, I'm seeing on peripheral vision, there's no more enemy right here. It lands, and it misses him. So I'm thinking, yes, but as it misses him, Tig's for some reason out of his position. He went to get water. And as he's running back, I mean, just talk about bad timing, it lands and boom, it blows up. So I watch Tig blow up. My night vision goes white because of the overabundance of light. And then I feel like, okay, he's dead. I'll clean his body parts up later. He can't quit. Can't give up there. Got to fight him off. They're trying to get on our compound. There's a lot more of them than there are of us. And I just turn and I just start shooting. And the team opens up. I could go into an hour on each firefight, guys. The movie did a good job showing that. If you haven't seen the movie, I recommend you watch it. I just don't have the time to go into each firefight, but all I remember is I'm just shooting them up. It takes about five minutes, and we fight them off. So as we fight them off and we see them taking off, I look, and I'm like, okay, so we get Tig, and I get up to go, and I'm going to start climbing down the stairs, and I don't see his body where I thought it should be, and I look at his fighting position. He's in his fighting position. And all I can think to myself, okay, I've been making fun of grunts, but I need to eat what they're starting to eat because I don't know how he survived off that. I need those hula bars they're eating. He got hit what was called a gelatina bomb. That's why he didn't die. <clears throat> gelatina bomb is what they use for fishing. It's Mediterranean redneck fishing. That's what it is. They drop it in the ocean, boom, fish come up. You all know what that's like. <laughs> I'm kidding. I love you all. I love you all. I love you <laughs> And because Tig's such a big dude, it didn't kill him. It would have killed me. I'm a little guy. It, it would have stopped my heart. But because it has no shrapnel in it, he lived. He still has problems with his shoulder and his back, but he fought through it. And he never quit. Well, between 1 and 3 o'clock in the morning, that's where we know that we come to the realization or the acceptance that there ain't nobody coming. We made reference to Domino's Pizza in the movie, and this is why we did it, because every so often Boone was getting updates of troops that could possibly come in our way. And he would come to me every five, 10 minutes. Hey, Delta's on its way from Spain. Then come back to me, no, they're not coming. Then come back to me five minutes later, hey, the fast company in Siganella, they're moving. No, they're not coming. Hey, the fast company of Marines from Spain, they're moving. No, they're not coming. The SIF's coming, commanders in extremist force. They're moving, no, they're not coming. And I finally just stopped because it was breaking my heart. I'm like, dude, if it ain't Domino's Pizza, don't tell me, I, I don't wanna know anymore. But you don't quit. At 3 a.m., we get hit again. And this is a more, I would say, a bigger force, quite a bit bigger. And these guys just keep coming through an area we called Zombie Land. That wasn't part of the movie. We actually did call this area Zombie Land because it looked like where zombies were going to come up off the ground and attack us. It was just eerie, especially at night, <clears throat> right next to a sheep slaughterhouse. So the smell was fantastic there every day. But I remember I saw them moving, and we just fought them off. I want to say it's beautiful because it's not. I, I, I do value human life, but it was just, it was just so intricate how just that everybody was working as a team together and just taking guys out, shooting. You're not getting on our compound. It reminded me of waves hitting a retaining wall. Just boom, to come. We fought them off. That one takes a little bit longer. I remember at that point in time, I get word that Bub's coming in. Bub's team was from Tripoli. Bub was on SEAL Team 3. Bubba had organized three other GRS guys, two Delta Force operators, uh, other interpreter, and he also managed to get an all executives jet to fly them from Tripoli to Benghazi. That wasn't part of the movie. That's how they got there. They flew <laughs> leather seats and Dom Perignon <laughs> into combat. <laughs> but I remember he's coming in to our compound, and he's a lot funnier than what he's portrayed in the movie. So he's on the radio getting pissed because nobody's been to Benghazi on his team, and they have this militia that doesn't know where our compound's at. He's on our radio just cussing up a storm, saying, guys, we don't know where you're at. We've been driving around for hours. Where's your compound? Can you vector us in? Can you give us some grid coordinates? Can you? And I just go, get your night vision on, bub, and I'll lasso the front gate. <clears throat> so he gets his night vision on. I go, you got it? He goes, Roger, I got it. And I put my infrared laser on my gun, and I put it up in the air. 
turn it on and I just go like this, lasso, it's just what it is, lasso, and then I point it and I sparkle out the front gate. That's how you call for firing with hel helicopters, rotary wings, or Spectre gunships. You sparkle, I was just using it to vector them in. So as I do this, I spin it, I point it at the front gate, I mark it, he goes, got it, finally got it. Why it took us so long to figure that out, I don't know. It just did. And as I put my weapon system down, it's 5 a.m. now. We've been at it for eight and a half hours. You can just feel the morale, the whole, the whole base. There's just no energy left. And I'm thinking, I'm like, oh, Tano, tell a joke. You got to tell a joke. You tell, you're Tano, tell a joke. Get people's, get people's morale up. I had a Snickers on the little parapet wall there, so I took a bite of that Snickers so I didn't feel like Rosie O'Donnell anymore. I felt like Tano. <laughs> it's true. Snickers does work. I'll tell you what. It doesn't make you happy. And that's not a political joke at all. That's just a grouchy person joke. That's all that is. <laughs> and I put my infrared laser down, I turned it off, and I go, Bob, you coming in? He goes, Roger that. I go, break, break. I said, guys, I know this is an awkward time to tell you this, but I've had to take a crap since we left the consulate. It's not a funny joke. It really isn't. It's not, it's not funny at all. The timing of it was funny. The only reason I could think of it, though, is because I did. For eight, geez, midnight till 5.30, had a turtle head crowning the whole freaking time. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you don't want to buy my shorts, y'all. You don't want to see. <laughs> I made fun of myself. We've lost that a little bit in our leaders. I, I, I learned that to a T at Range Battalion. Leaders are able to make fun of themselves. Self-deprecating humor. I learned from the best at Range Battalion. That's what we do. We make fun of ourselves to pick other people up. Yeah, we might rib at other people, but we're more likely to make fun of ourselves to pick others up. That's all I did. Self-deprecating humor got to have some confidence to do that. If you're too insecure to make fun of yourself to your troops to help the situation, maybe you shouldn't be in charge. Don't have that chip on your shoulder. The ones that I am more scared of are the ones that are so can make a joke and make fun of themselves, but you can tell their confidence in somebody that's just all the time. <clears throat> and we needed it. I heard the bass laughing. I could hear everybody laughing. I even heard Jack. I could hear him on his building. Oh, that's too much information, brother. <laughs> but it, we needed it. Well, Bub's team finally comes. They all go up to the building. They all go into the compound. Bub is the only one out of that whole team that goes up to building C. So I see building C. I'm on building A. Building A is right here. Building C is not quite to the back of the last row. And I see Bub, I see Oz, I see Roan, and I see Dave Ubin. And I see the militia park outside my front gate. And I hear a shh. It didn't sound like a mortar. My hearing had been shot out at that point, though. I couldn't hear. I don't wear hearing protection, and I can't hear, couldn't hear anything. My hearing was gone. And I went, did you guys hear that? And then something in my head goes, that's a mortar, you idiot. And I went, mortars, mortars, take cover. And as soon as I said take cover, I saw the first one, boom, hit, explodes. My night vision goes wide as it turns and comes back, and it focuses. I see Tyrone spin, and he goes cyclic with the machine gun that he has. Cyclic is when you hold the trigger down on a belt-fed weapon. And under night vision, it looks like a laser. <clears throat> And he's just laser beaming. And I see Bub shooting. I see Oz shooting. I see Dave, Dave shooting. And I put a few rounds over their head. And then I turn around and make sure that we're not getting overrun because I'm expecting to see the whole city of Benghazi overrunning my back wall. I see that militia that escorted Bub's team, they take off. I thought they were just taking off because they were scared. As I come back around to shoot some more, I see another round, mortar, 81 millimeter, go boom. And that one hit directly right on top of building C where all of our guys were. I see a guy go down. It was Dave Oopin. He hadn't got a chance to get his helmet back on, and he caught shrapnel on his face. He said, out of the fight. I can't quit. I keep shooting. As I come back, nobody's coming over our back gate. I come back again, and I see a boom, boom, boom. Three mortars hit directly on building C, and my night vision goes white, completely white, just from the overabundance of light. As it comes back, all I see is pixie dust. My team's gone. I don't see them anymore. They're gone. So my brain's going, your team just got turned to dust. That was the one time I did put my head down. I, I, I almost defeated. I was like, I can't beat this. I don't have any air support. And God said, get your gun up, Ranger. <laughs> and I got to fight. <clears throat> and I kept fighting. He never quit. You don't quit whatever's put in front of you. You've got to fight through it. No matter how hard it is to fight through it, you keep taking those steps. And I kept fighting, and I kept shooting, and Jack kept fighting, and Boone kept fighting. The mortar stopped, 
and I see Tig get up on that roof. I didn't know it was Tig at the time, but I see a guy get up the next day, though, when we were in Germany, and I mean, Tig were howling at the moon a little bit. I was asking him, I said, dude, what did you see when you got up, that bat, up on that building? He says, well, I saw Oz. Oz had actually was still trying to get up and fight, but his arm was flapping, so he had no way to hold his gun up. So he says Oz would shoot and then his rifle would fall. He says, well, I sat Oz down and then Oz was already trying to get a tourniquet out to get on his arm. He says, I helped Oz a little bit, but he says Oz seemed coherent enough that he could do it on his own. So he says, can you do this on your own? And he, Oz said, yeah. He goes, I went and helped the other guys. So Tig says, I went to Tyrone and I rolled him over because he was like in the fetal position and he heard him go, Whoosh. he basically died, he expired. He says, I still chew the look, listen, and feel. I detect his vitals. I try to revive him. He's, he, he, he was dead. He says, then I went to Bub. Bub was face down. He says, I rolled him over, and Bub was dead. Checked his vitals. Gone. He says, then I went to Dave Ubin. Dave's face was covered in blood, just mess. He says, his arm was this way, and his leg was this way. He says, I got tourniquets on Dave. And then he went back to Oz. <laughs> I'm laughing, not because of the situation, because of what happened, and because you Marines are really weird. <laughs> he says, Oz was doing this with his arm because he thought it was so cool, because he was going into shock. He was like, look what I can do with my arm. He was playing with it, doing 360s because the bone was gone. <laughs> and he goes, I talked to Tig. I go, dude, what would you do? He says, well, I was getting pissed because I thought the arm was going to pop off. <laughs> he goes, so I tightened down his tourniquet. And he kept saying, don't do it, stop it, stop turning with your arm. I go, well, what would you do to get him to stop playing with it? <laughs> he says, and this is how you get a Marine to stop playing with anything. He goes, I told him if he kept playing with it, he'd go blind, and he stopped. <laughs> 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 These Marines are some sick dudes. <laughs> you have no idea how funny combat is. It's just there's so much ridiculousness that goes on. You guys that have been in, I know you understand. He also gave Oz a job. He says, Oz, he goes, I got to go help these other guys. Can, can you get off this roof? And Oz says, yeah, I guess I'm going to have to. And Oz tightened the tourniquet down and climbed his own butt off that roof on his own with one arm. I, I remember just hearing his groans, too. Still, I can still hear the, just, just the pain he was in, climbing down that ladder and then just walking. And I caught the last glimpse of him because I, I just, I don't know, the curiosity got the best of me. I was cu pulling cover, and I heard him groan. I wanted to see what it looked like, and him walking, I turned, and I just remember him going like this, walking into the front of the building C to go to the triage area. I said, Oz and I don't get along a whole bunch. It's all right. Still respect him. And he's one of the toughest, the toughest MFers I've ever been around. Well, we wait around 5, 6 a.m., actually about 6 a.m., 7 a.m., my chief of base is telling me, and there's only three guns left, me, Jack, and Boone. And he says, Tano, you got the front gate. We got a militia coming in. Make sure they're friendlies. I said, Roger that, chief. What do they look like? He goes, we don't know. <laughs> I go, what color are their vehicles, chief? He goes, we don't know that either. I go, they have emblems, insignias, anything. He goes, we don't know that either. I go, chief, what do their uniforms look like? Guess what answer I got? <laughs> I go, do I have communication with them? No, we lost communication. I go, do you know how many? He goes, 30 to 50, including technicals. The technicals, a truck, basically a Toyota Tacoma with a big machine gun or an anti-aircraft gun in the back of it. I go, roger that, chief. I go, you realize I have an M4 left? And I flew through some expletives in there. I didn't get a response. And I saw that militia moving towards me. And I saw him coming, and it was... I've seen a lot of militias, a lot of those kind of motorcades, per se, in all these areas I went to, Kabul, Kandahar, Baghdad, uh, Hilla. <laughs> Got summer homes in all these places. Mosul, if you want to go visit. <laughs> it's great this time of year. Still, though, that, that one was massive. And Pablo played it just right. I saw it coming. I'm like, that's it, that's it. I wasn't giving up. It wasn't a give up. It was, okay. If that's what you're bringing at me, then all right, I'll take it. And I got behind that parapet wall, and I'm as small as I can make it. And I, I told you, I, I'm not a warrior. I'm not Howard ass or nothing. I was scared. No, my sphincter level was at sphincter 10. You could have put a lump of coal up my butt, and if you've seen Ferris Bueller, you know what it would have turned into. <laughs> Been a diamond in about five seconds. And I remember I'm like this looking, 
And I see the front guy in there chewing cotton. That dish goes pointed at me. And I see the, the pastor, he's chewing cotton, which is basically Copenhagen mixed with steroids and cocaine. The guy in the dishka is, is chewing cot as well, the 50 cal machine gun. And it looked like they both have been chewing it since birth because their teeth are just mangled, just goo all over their face. And I remember I went like this. That's not in the movie. That's not part of it. That wasn't movie magic. I threw up the jumbo. I learned the jumbo when I was working in Mosul from the Sudanese guards that were with us there. Every morning we'd go out the gate, they'd throw this, they go, hey, jumbo Tano. And I stopped them one day, and I said, what does that mean, guys? Because I thought they were telling me to F off every time I went out the gate. I said, no, it just means be cool. Really what it means is good morning. It started in Tunisia, but it morphed into the shaka, jumbo shaka. Same thing. Hey, man, be cool. So if I threw it up, nine times out of ten, no matter what country I was in, if I got it back, I knew they were friendlies. And so it went like this. I went, oh, this, is, this is not good. The guy that's chewing cotton in that front passenger vehicle, he smiles at me, and he reaches his arm out the window, and he goes, and the guy in the dish gunner comes off his gun, and he goes, my wife's here with me. She's beautiful, beautiful smile, beautiful 11-year-old daughter, gorgeous smiles. But to this day, I still have never seen a smile as beautiful as that poopy-looking, cot-filled grin I saw from this living. And my sphincter relaxed, and I just went on the radio and went, they're with us, they're with us. Have faith, always. Well, we got out of there with that militia. We got back to Benina, the airfield there in Benghazi. The oil executive's jet was there. We loaded all the non-shooters on there, and we loaded Dave Ubin and Mark Osgeis on there who were bleeding out. And that flew out, took off. Wasn't enough room for us. We had to stay. About 10.30 in that morning, I saw a C-130 land, and as it's coming in, I'm thinking to myself, finally, Air Force, finally, American, somebody. And I look at that tail boom, and it's a red, green, and black flag. And I went, still no Americans. It landed, it went by us, it parked, and it turns its engines off, and I saw the crew walking into their little building. And I looked at my team leader, and I go, is that for us? And he just kind of shrugged his shoulders. Long story short, guys, that plane wasn't for us. It just showed up. We got lucky. Faith always increases your luck. We went to talk to the pilots, and they flew us out of there. <clears throat> As we flew back, I remember we got to Tripoli. I took a couple hours off, borrowed some clothes from some of my buddies, got some food, took a quick nap, and then I got on the first aircraft, I saw a C-17 flown by Eric Stahl with the United States Air Force. We loaded the flag draped coffins on there and I sat next to him as we flew from Tripoli to Germany. When we got to Germany, the USO was right there, awesome. If you have any doubt about giving money to any foundations, never ever doubt the USO. It goes to where it needs to go, promise. The lady from the USO was there to greet us. And she came to me and she saw that I had basically was wearing clothes that weren't mine <laughs> because I'm not a big guy. Most GRS guys are a lot bigger than me. And she goes, what'd you lose, son? I said, ma'am, I lost everything. She handed me a piece of paper and a pen and she goes, write it down. I said, you know, I'm thinking, I said, yeah, right, whatever. Okay, sure. Yes, ma'am, you're very nice to me. I'll take the time. I wrote it all down, gave her the back of the piece of paper thinking, you know, I'm never gonna see anything, any of this again, no big deal. And I went to my room. And at 2 a.m., I hear a knock on my door at that room at the Air Force base we were at, and it's her, and she handed me a bag of stuff. And I opened it. And luckily, you know, it's an Air Force base, not a Marine or an Army base, so there's like a Saks Fifth Ave and a Macy's and a Neiman Marcus and, and all that stuff on that, on that base. <laughs> so I look up in the bag like, oh, my gosh, I got better stuff going out than I did coming back in. That was a different upgrade. It made me feel warm. I just, I just felt home. I went back to bed. I woke up the next morning, see somebody talking about a video in a protest. I turned the TV back off. I went back to bed. Then I came back home. And people think that we just told the story, like, oh, we're going to tell it. We're going to screw everybody. No. Every one of us took our two months off and went right back out the door. I went to Yemen and did another trip, did some more stuff. So the rest of the guys, except for Tig, he went to Lebanon. And I got to deal with that mess, and we screwed that place up. <laughs> then I came home, and the team as itself, we just got tired of being called liars, so we told the truth. About seven months after I got back from Yemen. <clears throat> 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 you 
Yeah. As ending up here, and I appreciate you guys waiting on me. I, I went a little longer than I usually do. Uh, it's just a good crowd. Really felt you guys made me feel good. What I want to tell you guys, though, and after all this, politics be damned, things are going to happen that need to be happening with this, with Benghazi. What I want to tell you folks, and I think I've learned a lot from then, with me being the angry person to who I once was when I came back to who I am now, which is a lot happier, is that we're, we're okay, guys. I still talk to groups everywhere that still want to hear the story which means something to me, it means that people want to know the truth, that we're not all blinded by the media. We aren't. People want to know what's going on. And they also still admire all you guys out there, especially the ones that have served. They do. It's good people out there. You guys have helped me overcome my problems. I have post-traumatic stress. It's not a disorder. I was diagnosed with it in 2007. I'm telling you this to you, some of you guys, because some of you guys go through it. I've tried to kill myself three times. Luckily, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> but every time that I think I'm going to do it, I think to myself, wait a second, I didn't quit in combat, I didn't quit when I was training, when I was me, I'm a ranger, I didn't quit on my buddies, why in the hell am I going to quit on the most important thing in the world, and that's me and my family, and I didn't do it. <clears throat> so as you guys move forward, remember Benghazi is just a situation, not politics, it's that you don't give up. Whatever verse you're faithful with, you don't give up. You Vietnam veterans out there, are there any in the room? On that building that night at 3 a.m. Uh, give them, yeah, give them a round of applause, definitely. <laughs> at 3 a.m., I, I joined the Ranger Battalion because I used to read the Hunter Killer teams. I used to read about the Lima Company and the Fox Company. I used to read the Vietnam Rangers, the companies. That's what made me want to join the Ranger Battalion, was the Vietnam Rangers. And when I was up there at 3 a.m., I kept remembering the stories of guys in Vietnam that were dropped off in the jungle for two weeks, that were left behind with no support for weeks on end, that were left behind when they came home. And all I could think of was, I can go another, and I can go an hour. I'm good, I got Snickers, I got coffee, I got plenty of ammo, I can go another hour. You guys have no idea how well and how much you push us to be better and also to not give up either. I didn't quit because of you guys. It's like, oh my gosh, if I quit after another hour, these rangers from Vietnam, all these Vietnam guys that served the CAV and the infantry and all these units, <laughs> I can't even hold their jock strap. You guys are well admired, especially in the special operations community. We always are just striving to try to beat guys like you. So I want to say thank you to you guys in the room. Thank you all you Vietnam vets for pushing me and helping me live that night. And thank you all everybody else for being here and listening to me run my suck a little bit. God bless you all. Thank you for having me. And where's my Evans guys? I'm sorry I made you worry. I know I was a little bit late and I went over. I was a little bit late and then I went a little bit longer. I'm just an ass, aren't I? I'm terrible. Now, Colin, yeah, Colin, come on out, man. Colin, I, this is my man here that brought me in. Guys, I can't admire you, much. admire you more than anything in the world. God bless you all. Thank you for having me and thanks for letting me talk to you. Thanks, bro. <laughs> My change, there we go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Dave and Colin Evans. <laughs> Thank you. The absolute best part was is he had no idea what the music was going to be. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, was, that was a good time. Holy moly, was that a... What? Man! 
that was uh, right before we walked on stage. I was talking to the, our pastor, and uh, I got a quote um, from a guy named Jesse Isler that spoke at our conference back in January. It says, pressure is a privilege because great things happened beyond the wall of pressure. And I was like, it hit me, it hit me even further today. And then hearing, hearing that, wow, guys, was that awesome? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Incredible. I love his story about persevering, protecting his family, never giving up. I said when I introduced him that he was going to talk about the inner strength that drove him. And he's an inspiration to us all. And we thank him. Wait, I got something as, <laughs> as, as I have mentioned before, to make positive, life-changing, lasting differences in the communities that we serve. What greater honor to serve those that have served our country. I am humbled to be in the presence of heroes. I do have to ask uh, a couple of questions. One is, so, if you enjoyed this party, would you like me to do this party again? Yeah. As I told you, when I, you know, I had to go home and take an extra blood pressure medication today. I was like, oh, because my anxiety is way up here. Uh, it's a big deal. To, to host this, and I've got an enormous, enormous team that I'm pointing out on the fifth row, that helps back us up, that gets to be able to go, yeah, we want, we want to be a part of this. We really do. Again, I can't stress enough to each and every one of you here, pay attention to the folks that help sponsor this. They care about veterans. I never, ever want that that group of, of heroes to ever feel like they're ever forgotten. And, it's, and I, I don't want to even leave that at veterans. Who look over here? We've got a majority of Louisiana State Police. They're heroes as well. I, I, we can't thank, we cannot thank The, the veterans, we can't thank the first responders. We cannot thank them enough. You know, when they're thrown under the bus on social media, you know, and they are, and I hate that, but unfortunately that's a society we live in. But what we can do, love them. You get the opportunity or you get the chance. Dave does this, I, I, I absolutely love doing this too. Um, at the airport or when you're out at lunch, if a veteran's in front of you or you see a Barksdale person or a law enforcement officer, sneak up and buy their lunch. What's it cost you, $12? You made them feel appreciated for that moment. We're a community that I, I, I truly believe that loves to give back. And we still have a heart because we're still human. And we still care for other people. Remember the businesses that helped this out. I get to see friends in the audiences. I get to see my friend Leonard from Yoka, my friend Mark at Holmes, and I've got my friend Brian's over here from Bulldog Oil. They helped us. Give the businesses one more round of applause if you guys don't mind. Any latecomers, uh,
Brad, if you could toss that image one up there. Um, make sure you text if we had any latecomers that would like to uh, get registered to win that AR-15. I'm going to give it away on Friday. Follow our Facebook page. I'll give that on, away on live media. I would be absolutely honored if you guys that don't know us personally, stop by our office. Just say hi. Come in. Every lady that leaves our office, we actually we give roses to. Because it's, it's cool. And you know what, guys? We can still go, do cool things for women. It's still, it's still an okay deal. I think it can kind of be a lost art. But one of our virtues is we truly want to be your last financial advisor. Dave? We had a guy come in our office about, uh, probably about four months ago, and he had said, by the way, I went to your veterans event and I wanted to share something with you. And he gave me a plaque and it had a star in it. And there's an organization, the name escapes me, but before a flag is, is done away with and burned, there's someone that cuts the stars out. And the stars are then put on this plaque. And there's a little scripture verse that goes along with it. But he said, I, want, I wanted to share that with you and say thank you for doing what you did for veterans. I want to say thank to, thanks to our staff who helped in the orchestration of all this that you, you met as you came in. We had some other volunteers that helped give out the bags. A lot of the bags have goodies in them that are um, jet donated by the people who you see uh, advertised here. We came to honor you. We came to say thank you for your service. I loved it when I came in, and this happened last year too, and I saw all the hats. And the hats had units and, and, and branches of service that they've served in. It's an honor to be in your, in your presence. I too am a vet. I salute you. I want to say thank you. I want to say may God bless you and your family. Have a safe trip home.